Thank you very much. Uh, it's been really inspiring this week to see all the passion about open source. And uh, I, I want to talk to you about what you do tomorrow when you take that passion back to work. Um, my name is, is Rich Bowen, and I have been working with the Apache Software Foundation for about 25 years. And uh, I'm currently working as an as a open source strategist at AWS. On Friday, Wei Jin Fang talked a little bit about your motivations in uh, in working on open source, including how much fun it is. And on Saturday, Emily talked about how your everything that you do in open source is driven by your original purpose. And uh, so what I want to talk to you about today is the fact that uh, your, okay, this one's not advancing. <laughs> you know, I want to talk to you about how your uh, motivation in doing open source is often different from your employer's motivation. Yeah, there we go, that works. Now, the reason that you should care about this content is that today you're here at this wonderful event surrounded by people that share your passion. And next week when you go back to work, you'll have to communicate that passion to your manager who may not have the same motivations. Now, you like working in open source, but you also want your company to be successful. So I want you to think about why you participate in open source. And we've talked about this all week long. Some of the reasons that people give for participating in open source include that it's fun, that it's a way to uh, meet other people with similar passions and form lifelong friendships. And I have lifelong friendships with people in this room because of my involvement in open source. Um, another reason that people give is that uh, it gives you career opportunities or advances your knowledge of technology. These are some of the reasons that were given in a, uh, a, a survey a few years ago on opensource.com. And you'll see that the top three reasons that are given are to learn something new or advance your career, because it's fun, and the third largest reason is altruism, which means doing things for unselfish reasons because you're giving back to the world. You're making the world a better place. And uh, this, this is how I view conferences like this. We get to sit around a campfire with friends and we share stories and we sing songs and we, uh, we enjoy uh, roasting food over the campfire with our, with our dear friends. Um, and also, when we come to these events, we often share stories with one another about our managers who don't understand why we do this. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to say that this is not why your company does open source. Your company has very different motivations. And when you're running a company, your first obligation is to make a profit, to support your employees with a wage, to, uh, to create value for your shareholders. Um, and, you know, I want to clarify that when, when a company gets involved in open source, there are several, uh, there, there's often three different ways that they get involved in open source. One is just consuming open source, using open source software. Another is contributing back to that, which is another level up, and you have to be very persuasive to get your company to do that. And then another level up, which many of you have been involved in, is taking internal source code and making it open source, which is a significant investment and a big risk. It's a big business risk to take your intellectual property and give it to the world. So persuading your manager to do that may be difficult. Now, of course, because you are in this room, that means that your manager is probably supportive of this. They've allowed you to come to this event. Uh, my manager is David Nally. He's the president of the Apache Software Foundation, and so he understands the value of open source. But uh, my manager's manager does not understand open source quite as well as we do. 
And so we have to be persuasive in ways that make sense. When you speak to your manager about open source, you need to talk their language. And their language does not involve things like your passion or your altruism. It involves things about the good of the company. And I want you to understand that I'm not telling you to lie to your manager. I'm telling you to translate into their language. And their language is uh, practical. But the thing is, open source also is practical. Open source has always been about solving problems. And most of us, I know when I got involved in open source, it was about solving my own problems. Uh, when I first got involved in open source, it was because I was trying to run a website and the software did not work exactly as I expected and so I needed to get involved in the community to make that better. Um, your company is also interested in open source because it provides practical solutions. Now, your company is not necessarily only interested in money. Many of the companies that we work for are genuinely interested in making the world a better place. They're interested in providing a good life for their employees. Um, but another thing that the company might be interested in, open source for, is to make the product better, to make their service better. Um, they might be interested in open source due to cost concerns. Open source might make it cheaper for them to produce a product. So that's another thing that they might be looking for. Open source is a great way to improve the reputation of your company. If your company is involved in open source, the world may look at you and believe that your company is interested in making the world better. And this, in turn, is good for the recruitment of new employees. And also, many companies are interested in leaving a legacy. They want to leave the world better than they found it. So, all of this leads to how do you take your passion, how do you take the excitement that you've had this weekend at this event back to your manager and persuade them to let you work on things that are free and may seem impractical? One of the first ways that we tend to speak about open source is in terms of philosophy. We talk about how important it is for things to be free and equitable and diverse. Um, I would encourage you not to start with philosophy when you talk to your manager. Uh, if you start talking to your manager about the differences between the Apache software license and the MIT license and the GPL and the Mozilla license, about two minutes into this conversation, they're going to find that they have another meeting that they need to go to. Uh, they don't want to talk to you about philosophy. They don't want to debate the difference between free software and open source software. They probably don't care. Um, these things detract from the core message. And they lead your manager to believe that you're talking about a hobby or perhaps a charity rather than something that is central to their key business practices. Now, I do want to mention that this book here, Open Sources, it's absolutely worth reading. It is full of great essays, uh, such as The Cathedral and the Bazaar, that are, that are excellent for understanding the origins of open source. But this is to share with your manager a year from now, not tomorrow. You have a very limited time when you're speaking to upper management to make your point. And so you need to get to the core issues rather than focusing on the philosophy. So you need to understand what makes your manager, uh, what your manager values. One of the things that we talk about in open source is giving back. We have obtained something from the community and we have an obligation to give back. And we talk about this as though it is a moral obligation, um, but your company is not a charity. Your company is not there to
to give money to other people. Your company is there to make money. So you need to, you need to change the way that you talk about giving back. Um, management will often see open source as a free resource, a renewable resource that they can forever take. And there's no end in sight. We can always take and take and take. Uh, but if you, if you talk about open source as a charity, then you are going to be the first thing that cuts when, is, is cut when they start lowering the budget. So instead, what I encourage you to do is talk about the supply chain. Open source is your business's natural resource that you are consuming in order to create a product. And if the supply chain is weak, if you're this, this weak link in the middle of the supply chain, then you are putting your business at risk. And so what you need to do is talk about open source as something that needs to be nurtured so that it is sustainable. You need to invest in open source so that it's there tomorrow, so that when your customers come looking for a product a year from now, your supply is still there. Now, this is not unique to the software industry. This is true for any business. If you are a carpenter, you want to make sure that there are trees for you to make products out of tomorrow. So when you cut down a tree, you plant a new tree. And this is how we should think about open source software. It's not a resource that will forever be there. It is something that you need to support. Uh, you need to demonstrate with numbers, with uh, uh, numbers in money as to how software how open source software contributes to your product. If you have an open source project that is being produced out there somewhere on GitHub, do some research. See how many people are involved in producing that that you are not paying. Maybe you should invest more in those people. Maybe you should hire some of them. It's also a good idea to talk about things that have gone wrong when companies have not invested in open source. And this is long-term thinking. Uh, it's not about solving today's problems. It's about solving next year's problems. And it also shows your manager that you are considering the long-term health of the product of the company and not just tomorrow's paycheck. So uh, sometimes I encourage people to tell scary stories. Um, you may be familiar with some of these logos up here. This is Heartbleed and Spectre and Meltdown. Um, all of you are familiar with the Log4j incident a year ago where a, uh, an open source project caused the world software business a, a great deal of panic. Now, as David Nally mentioned on the first day of the event, the, the project stepped up and fixed that problem very quickly, but many Many companies, many software products still have not patched with the newest version. And this is a way that, that uh, you, can, you can convince your, uh, your manager that each one of these incidents here happened because of low community engagement. They didn't happen because the software was necessarily bad. They didn't happen because it was open source. They happened because the people consuming it were not giving back to it. Um, there is a, I think it was Linus Torvalds who said, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. And this is only true if the many eyes are actually looking. And so as a company consuming an so, uh, open source software project, you need to be looking. You need to be looking at the health of this project to ensure that it's there tomorrow. And of course, you may have seen this, uh, this this uh, comic, I'm sure you've all seen this. This is about how um, your company here at the top is supported by an open source project down there on the bottom that's maintained by one individual who you've never talked to. You should talk to them. You should invest in them. You should see whether that project needs more developers. The best way that companies can contribute to open source is with you. You developers, not necessarily money, although money is also important. Make sure you understand the needs of that project. Now, I'm, I'm making up numbers here. 
but uh, I encourage you to talk to your manager with numbers. Talk to your manager with data. Say, we have this product that made this much money last year, and it is entirely dependent on a project in open source that is developed by three people that we've never talked to. Maybe we should fix that. Maybe we should invest in that. Um, always tie your conversations into a company priority. In this case, the priority that we're talking about is profitability and budget. Uh, but maybe your company has other priorities that you need to include in your conversation when you're talking about open source projects. Now, the most important thing about your supply chain is that it is sustainable. Um, so this leads to the question, what is sustainable open source? And, and Richard touched on this a little bit in his talk about how you need to make sure that you're continuing to invest in a project to make sure that it's sustainable and there tomorrow. So what makes a project sustainable? Um, in my view, the most important thing that makes a project sustainable is a diverse bunch of developers that represent your users. They represent your customers. And so you want to ensure that you're not basing your entire company on a project that is developed entirely by one of your competitors. Because maybe next week they will change the license and then you won't be able to use it anymore. And that has been happening more and more frequently later, lately. It's been kind of frightening. Um, you need to make sure that an open source project is responsive to your customers' needs. And that means that they have a mechanism for you to give feedback and contribute so that your customers' needs are being heard and responded to. Um, at AWS, we talk about open source being, uh, the phrase that we use is undifferentiated heavy lifting, which is a fancy way to say that the open source project does the things that are common to all of us, and then as a company, we focus on what we are good at. And by sharing that heavy lifting with the whole community and then focusing on what we're good at, we're able to lift all boats. There's a phrase in English, the tide lifts all boats. And that means that sometimes when you improve an open source project, you help your competitors. And that's okay because we're all part of a community developing this stuff. Um, single vendor projects, I have an entire other conference presentation about the dangers of single vendor projects. If only one company is, being, is, is involved in the development of a project, then they don't care about your needs. They care about their needs. And of course, that's, that's obvious in retrospect. If I'm developing a project for myself, I only care about myself. But if, I, if someone else is using that project, then they need to think about the implications of that company changing their priorities tomorrow. When more than one vendor is involved in a project, then you, uh, you end up with a more diverse set of inputs. And uh, Bill Joy, who was the founder of Sun Microsystems, he famously said, um, no matter where you work, the smartest people in the world work somewhere else. And so you need to seek their input in your, into your software and, and get this more diverse view because other companies will think of things that you have not thought of. Um, having open source projects at Apache that have a Chinese group of developers working on them has greatly changed our perspective at the Apache Software Foundation. It's given us a, a view that not all the world is North America. And <laughs> this is extremely important because if our software is used in China, then we need to have a Chinese voice in the conversation. Um, having Multiple, uh, another big concern is open source projects that are developed by only one individual. And if you look at GitHub statistics, the normal project on GitHub has one developer. 
overwhelmingly that is true. And you look at that project and you think, well, it could go away tomorrow if that, if that developer has a skiing accident or you know, if they, if they win the lottery and decide they don't want to work anymore. But so often companies base their entire product on one of these projects. And so you're, you're betting your entire company on the fact that one developer that you've never talked to may not decide tomorrow morning to get up and work on it. All right, let's talk about something else. One of the other reasons that people give for, div for being involved in open source is for to, to build their own merit and reputation. To, uh, to make friends, to, to uh, increase their own reputation in the open source community. Now, your company is not interested in how popular you are. Um, it, it may feel good when you get a pull request merged. Uh, your company doesn't care about that. Your company wants to be successful. They're not interested in your popularity. So, instead, when you talk to your manager about building merit, building reputation, what you should instead talk about is building trust, building influence in the industry, being the person that drives the industry. So that, that's the reason for this picture of my daughter here. She's, she's, driving, um, she's driving in a direction that she is choosing, and you want your company to be seen as the leader. Um, this has many benefits. Obviously, it makes customers want to come to you because you're the one that's leading. Now, I want to caution you that this message can be dangerous. If you tell your company you need to be a leader, they may hear, we need to take over this project and, and uh, ignore everyone else. Now, that's not what I'm saying at all. You want your company to deeply understand collaboration and involvement in open source and not merely try to take over. Um, so you want to think about ownership. You want to think about how you are a part owner of a project, but you don't want to think that you're the only owner. Don't claim that you invented the project and then ignore the rest of the community. Um, also, remember that when you contribute to an open source project, there's no guarantee that your contributions will be accepted, and that can be frustrating. So you need to have a plan for that. But surveys show, and my, my company has done a number of surveys over the last couple of years where we ask customers what they care about, why they care about open source. And what we hear again and again is, we care that you're a leader in an open source project because it shows that you're invested in the longevity, the sustainability of that project, and it shows that you're an expert. Because if you have people working on a project, then you are showing that you're an expert in that technology. You also want to talk about adoption. Open source can drive adoption. One of the things that our customers tell us is that they like open source because they can download it, and build and test at home. Um, they, can, they can do an implementation uh, proof of concept in their own laboratory before they deploy your product. And this allows them to build expertise, and it allows them to build their own trust in the community and not just rely entirely on you. It also means that uh, they are able to switch to another company if they find that you're not satisfying them. That may not be a very convincing argument to your manager, but it is also an argument to increase your expertise and your involvement in the community. So, the other reason that people give for being involved in open source is that it's fun. Um, this is a photograph from a conference that I went to in November uh, in Kenya, and there's a bunch of my new friends in Kenya having fun in the party bus. And, uh, Open source is fun. I love going to conferences and talking with people about our shared passions. And I love being in, in the party bus with my, my friend Kamau here. And um, your employer does not care that you have fun. <laughs> that is not something they're terribly interested in. But one thing I encourage you to talk to them about 
is recruitment. If your company is involved deeply in open source, then chances are that the world will know this because everything you do in open source is public. And people will see that you're involved in open source and they'll say, I want to work there. And uh, they'll come and apply for jobs and you won't have to spend as much money on recruitment because your code will recruit for you. Now, I do want to warn you that if you hire someone and tell them that they're going to be working on open source, you better let them work on open source because I have a number of stories from friends who've been recruited to work for a company. They've been told they'd be working on open source. They get there and, oh, by the way, we need you to do these other things instead. And that can be not only frustrating for that individual, but they will tell their friends. And uh, so make sure that, that if you use open source as a recruiting tool, then uh, you actually Keep your promises. Open source is all, uh, building one's resume is often cited as a reason for being involved in open source. It allows me to build my skills and that allows me to get another job. Your employer is not interested in you going and looking for another job, so don't tell them that this is why you're doing open source. Um, so instead, what you want to talk about is continuing education. Talk about how being involved in open source allows you to increase your skills in a community of experts. And this education is, is free. Well, it's not really free. It costs your time. It costs your effort. But uh, you're getting this training. You're getting this on-the-job training in a community of experts. These people in this room are some of the best experts in open source in the country and in the world. And you have the opportunity to come to this event and share ideas with them. That is something that most companies would pay a lot of money for. And yet here we are, and uh, we're, we're learning from one another. So speaking of being free, this photograph here is a free kitten that my daughter gave me. And uh, this is just a reminder that nothing is free. This cat has to be fed, and it has to be taken to the doctor, and it has to, be, it has to have a place to live, and uh, it takes up space on my back porch. But uh, like open source, um, it's, not, it's not free. It's not really free. Um, and so telling your management that open source is cheaper than, than uh, proprietary software you know, it might not be true. You're, you're paying the money in different places. You're paying for expertise and for training and for implementation. So free is an important word, but what you want to talk about instead is customer value. Uh, software, uh, one, one of my colleagues says in her talk frequently at open source conferences, software is easy, people are hard. Uh, getting new customers is difficult. Customers come to you because they trust you. Now, all of your companies have a product, they have a service, but what they really have is trust. They have the trust of the customers. And that is the thing that you get in open source. You have your work out there, the whole world can see what you're doing, and trust is your main product. Uh, what we have found at AWS, is that people don't choose AWS. What they choose is, for example, Apache Kafka. And then they look around and they see, where can I run Apache Kafka in the cloud and get the best deal? And we like to think that that's us. Your company might think that it's you. And building trust is the center of that argument. Participation in open source establishes that you have expertise in the technology. And everyone can look at GitHub and see that your engineers worked on that project and then they'll know these are the experts. You don't have to tell them we're the experts, they can see it. Um, open source is a way to make companies compete on expertise rather than on the software. I mentioned that earlier. And uh, if you... If you sell software, open source is a way for the customer to directly influence the direction of that software. 
So it gives customers a voice in how you do things. Now, I am out of time. There's many other things that I can talk about, um, and uh, I'd be glad to talk with you about these things later on. You'll frequently have managers say, well, can't we just take that open source project and fork it and take it internal? And you need to be able to talk with them about why that's not always a great idea, the costs and risks of doing that. Um, you'll often have companies say, we should just write our own, that way we'll control it. Well, yes, you could, but there's a whole conversation to be had around that. And then sometimes your employer will say, we should just pay those, those maintainers. We should just send them a few, a, f a little bit of money every month or hire them and then not have to, we won't have to think about it after that. And that's only a partial solution. So each one of these things, like I said, I can talk, with a, talk about for a, a long time. Um, I just want to finish on this one note. Open source is a marathon, not a sprint. And what I mean by that is that when you invest in open source today, you won't see the results today. You will see the results in a year or two. And that can be very frustrating to management. One thing that, that managers struggle with most in open source is being patient. It can take a long time to achieve consensus on a decision. Why can't I just do that myself now and, and go with it? Well, it's because you're participating in a larger community and benefiting from the viewpoint of the whole community. And these are things that you need to be able to, to talk with your manager about. This is, my, this is my son finishing a marathon a couple of years ago, and this is one photograph, but he trained for six months for this. This is a long-term investment. So uh, thank you. Um, I'm sure that I have more to say, but I don't have more time. So uh, please feel free to come talk with me throughout the rest of the day, and thank you so much for the, the honor of speaking at this event.